Welcome. Uh, my name is John. I'm super grateful that you are here, particularly on a weekend where people have started to head out of town. So if you are joining us online, we love that you are here as well. And some of you that attend regularly um, maybe are nervous on Alex's behalf, not only because I'm going to talk about the sweater, but you're like, oh no, he forgot the scripture reading. Um, he did not forget the scripture reading. We agreed not to do that this Sunday, although we normally do, uh, because our goal for today is to cover all of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, which might sound daunting and terrifying, and we just didn't want you to walk out as he read the entire uh, chapter. But it's actually going to be uh, far more digestible than you might think. Here's what you need to know about 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It is essentially uh, one long extended uh, case study. So if you went to business school, this sermon is for you. Um, he is taking the ideas that he started walking through in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Remember, if you were here last week, it was sort of this exploration of the relationship between the freedom that we have in Christ, that our relationship with God is not dependent on anything we do, but that our relationship with God is dependent on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And he says, okay, so you are free in Christ as it comes to um, performing your way into a relationship with God, yet that freedom is often limited in the way that we live it out, or it's shaped by the fact that we want to live lives um, that are constructive in serving other people. And he did all of this by talking about food sacrificed to idols and idolatry. And then he comes back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and he's right back on the subject of food sacrificed to idols and idolatry, which begs this question of, wait a minute, we're doing food and idolatry in 8, food and idolatry in 10. Why in the world does he seemingly take a break in the middle of that, sandwich right between, and do chapter 9? He's like, anyway, enough about meat sacrificed to idols. Let's just talk about me for a while. Like, let's just reflect on my ministry. And what he is trying to do is kind of take this discussion that can seem very theoretical, very academic, and he's just trying to apply it to his life, right? He's trying to say, hey, if we were to live our lives according to the principles we see in 1 Corinthians 8, it would look a lot like a 1 Corinthians 9 kind of life. So as you read through 1 Corinthians, you're going to see that there really is this strong theme throughout the chapter of Paul limiting his liberty for the sake of the gospel of Paul allowing his freedom to be shaped by love for other people. But one of the things that you would also notice is that the entire narrative of what Paul is trying to construct really is shaped by the reality that Paul, as a follower of Jesus Christ, Paul as an individual, had an enormously compelling vision for his own life. You know, you see that right at the beginning of the chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 and 2, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? He's asking all of these questions rhetorically, and he's doing it with a construct in the Greek that makes it incredibly clear that his assumption is that the answer to all of these questions is yes. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord, Damascus Road? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, every once in a while that was controversial because Paul wasn't one of the original 12 disciples. At least I am to you because you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So we see this guy who has a very clear understanding of the specific role he plays in the growth of the church, the specific role he plays in the coming of the kingdom of God, that he defines himself primarily as an apostle. He lives that out a lot of different ways. He's one part church planter, one part missionary, one part writer, one part evangelist, one part pastor, but fundamentally he sees himself as an apostle. And I realize at this point it would be tempting to kind of bail on the sermon and think like, okay, this is just one of those ones that's, you know, really just for pastors and missionaries and the rest of us are invited to listen in. But don't do that because one of the things he actually talks about a lot during 1 Corinthians 9 is that he makes his living as a tent maker. 
All right, so this is a sermon for lawyers and doctors and teachers and people who work on Amazon and people who work on the Hill and all over the place. This is not a sermon about where we make our living from. It's a sermon about whether or not we have a clear vision for how God wants to work through our lives for His glory and for the good of other people. And that really specific vision is being carried along by a deep passion. If you drop down to 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul says this, for if I preach the gospel, I have no reason to boast because I am compelled, compelled by the grace and the calling of God. I am compelled to preach so much so that he would say, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So there's a deep passion in a specific vision that come together to animate all of Paul's life, right? And my prayer for us is that we would learn to follow Jesus in such a way that he becomes the compelling vision of our lives. Right? That church is not just something we do on Sunday, that the Bible is not just something we read when we know we've sinned and need to read something that is somehow going to restore us to a sense of fellowship with God or just be a balm for our guilt and our shame, that Jesus would not just be some sort of mythical figure, because of course he's not, he's real and he's alive, that Jesus wouldn't be the summation of a bunch of moral teachings, although he calls us to live with a very clear ethic, that we would give get to the point where we say that the actual vision for our lives is shaped by Jesus, that the more we get to know Him, the more He shapes every single aspect of our lives. And the reason that that vision will become so compelling is that if you make it your ambition to follow Jesus, at least to follow Jesus that way, to follow Jesus the way the Bible calls us to, you will end up living a life that is radically different from the world that we live in. So, so much so that we will get to the point where we say, wait, it's not just that Jesus is shaping the vision for my life. It's like Jesus has become the vision for my life. All I'm trying to do is follow him and work out the details as a single grad student or a married mother of three or as a young professional or a military officer. I'm just trying to work out the details of it. Right? Chapter 9, like I said, is a case study of what that kind of life looks like, right? Chapter 9 is a case study of what it looks like when Jesus becomes the vision for our lives. In a sense, Paul is doing something that Seth Godin talks about a lot. Um, one of the phrases he uses, if you're familiar with his work, and he uses it a lot, he uses it to describe uh, culture and leadership and marketing and so many other things, but he will say that so much of the project of leadership and culture formation is kind of creating this sense that, quote, people like us do things like this, right? He'll, he'll use this to explain so much of advertising, right? Or you're trying to create this sense of like people like us use Macs, not PCs. Or people like us shop on Amazon, not on Walmart. Or people like us drive electric cars, not pickup trucks. Or you could obviously do the inverse if you lived in a different portion of the country and be like, no, people like us have PCs and go to Walmart and drive pickup trucks and have extra money in our savings account as opposed to the rest of all you people up in big cities, you know, that have to do your cool trendy things but are impoverished as a result, right? Um, so wherever you go, people like us do things like this. That's kind of what Paul's doing. He's like, hey, people like us, assuming you and I would count ourselves in people like us who are trying to follow Jesus, we end up doing things like this, things like take great pains not to hinder the gospel. That's really what he's up to in verses 1 through 18. Um, he creates this elaborate argument, really, in verses 1 through 14 about why he had every right to be paid for his work as a pastor, a church planter, an apostle, right? There was a part of me that was tempted to actually get up and have Alex just read verses 1 through 14 and tell you that the title of today's sermon is Why John Gets Paid. Um, because he really does devote 14 verses 
in classic Paul fashion. He's like, let me try a couple analogies. So he talks about a soldier, a farmer, a shepherd. He tosses in an Old Testament reference. He does a little bit of like, hey, spiritual leaders are trying to like impart to you the word of God. It doesn't seem like that big a deal that you would contribute financially to their support and all that kind of thing. He says those that preach the gospel should make their living according to the gospel. He leans in really heavily, so much so that you're like, wait a minute, is Paul frustrated? Frustrated with them that they are somehow not taking care of him? Is Paul upset? Is he just trying to get this into the Bible because he knows that there will be churches over the years that will try to, you know, abuse pastors by having them live in near poverty conditions? Like, is he just fighting this fight on behalf of other people? Like, what is he doing? And then you realize, wait a minute, he's doing all of this so that he can get to verse 12 where he says, if others have this right to receive benefits from you, don't we even more? Remember, he was the guy that planted the Corinthian church. He got the whole thing started. Nevertheless, here's where he's been going. We have not made use of this right. Instead, we endure everything so that we will not hinder the gospel of Christ. I want you to pay attention to what Paul's doing here because so often when we think about not hindering the gospel, we think exclusively in terms of not doing bad things, right? That we don't want to do, or maybe more honestly, don't want to get caught doing anything that would discredit Jesus. So, you know, this is why you're working at cursing less in the office and not yelling at the umpire at your kid's little league game and flipping people off on the beltway and like all that kind of stuff. And yes, that's true. Paul talks a lot about walking worthy of the gospel and nothing hinders the gospel more than hypocrisy, right? That is probably the number one charge whenever you get into a conversation with somebody about being a follower of Jesus and they're like, yeah, 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 I get it. Jesus, King of Kings, Prince Pete, got it, love it. You go to church, you seem like a great person, but let me tell you about so-and-so who was all about Jesus and all like the worst person I've ever met all at the same time, right? And that frustrates us to no end, right? And it's easy to be like, yeah, I'm thinking about somebody right now. That's fair. That's totally fair. It's even more compelling to ask the question, when do we become those people? But what I want you to notice is that Paul doesn't stop there. He, he doesn't say, hey, Restoration City, as you go into your week, this week, as you think about Thanksgiving, here it is, here's the big one, just work really hard not to be a jerk. If you could just not be a jerk, that's going to cause the angels to do backflips and the Spirit of God will come. And that's what we're after as followers of Jesus. Just try not to be rude. Try not to tell your uncle what you really think of him and just try to get through Thanksgiving without too much controversy and conflict. If you could do that, Gold Star, come on back next Sunday and we'll all take communion together. No, he's actually proactively thinking about any and everything that could get in the way of his ministry, that could hinder the advance of the gospel, so much so that he has this realization that people could say to him, wait a minute, dude, I get what you're doing. You're just in this for the money, right? By the way, that would have been incredibly relevant in Corinth because to be a public teacher in Corinth was tremendously respected, and it was tremendously lucrative, right? Orators would go, and they would make these great speeches, and people would come, and people would voluntarily donate a lot of money. In other words, if you could draw a crowd in Corinth through your speaking ability, you were going to make a lot of cash off that. And Paul's like really aware of that. He's like, wait a minute, I, I'm preaching to a lot of people. I'm writing letters that are being publicly read. People could say that I'm just in it for the money. I know. What if I don't take a dollar? And what if I just go make tents? To which you're like, hmm, maybe Alex should have read that passage. And we could have turned the sermon into like, so why do we pay you, John? John which is like a very fair question. Um, 
I'm extremely grateful for the way this community takes care of myself and my family and John Michael and his family and Dan and Susan and our staff team and the way we give generously um, to make ministry happen in this city. But I will also tell you that personally, and I don't know if it would ever, ever happen. I have no plan or anything like that. But man, I would one day, oh, it would be so great to be able to say the same thing to this church that Paul says to the Corinthians. Right? Wouldn't it be, I would just dream of like, wouldn't it be great if I was somehow able to support my family another way and still show up here week in and week out, not just Sundays, but all week long and serve and lead and pastor and be like, look, y'all, I don't get paid a cent for this. Right? There would be a reward in there that is absolutely beautiful, right? This is what Paul's thinking about in 14 and 15. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should earn their living by the gospel, so there's nothing at all wrong with pastors or ministers or anybody getting paid. For my part, I have used none of these rights, nor have I written these things that they may be applied in my case. For it would be better for me to die than for anyone to deprive me of my boast. Paul feels strongly about this. And then in verse 18, he says, what then is my reward? His reward is to preach the gospel and offer it free of charge and not make full use of my rights in the gospel. And like I said, I get that, right? Because some of the work that I have to do in my heart every single week is like, man, am I here because I love Jesus? Am I here because I love his word? Am I here because I love you? And I can tell you by the grace of God, I think that's why I'm here. But there's always that occasional Sunday where you're like, yeah, but it's also your job and your family likes to eat. Um, it's also, are you sure you're not just here for the check? Yeah, are you sure you're not just here for the same reason that you sometimes go to work when you're having an off week or something like that? So I get what Paul's saying. I will say, as an aside, part of the way that you know you're starting to tap into a compelling vision for life is whether you ever do it or not, that you have this sense of, man, I would do this for free. Man, I would do this for free if I could, right? That, that's confirming, right? Paul goes very specific. He's very financial in here, and the vast majority of us don't live this out by, you know, voluntarily giving service to the church, although in a sense many of us in the room live it out by voluntarily giving service to the church and serving in kids and connect and production and all kinds of things. I'll, I'll give you one of the other ways that I live it out. Maybe, it, maybe it'll ring true in your life. Um, you may have noticed, if you haven't, here it is. Um, I try to be really careful how I talk about politics. Um, if you're wondering, are we like a super partisan church? No. Um, and I work really hard to make sure that's the case. I work really hard not to talk about politics in the way that you have to work really hard if you first came to this city as an undergrad to be a government major, which was my story. That's my background. I was the kid freshman year that over winter break, I interned in the congressman's district office at home and then came right back and interned on the hill in the spring. I was, you know, that little like overeager, slightly obnoxious kid. Um, that was me. Um, I was that guy. And I still am like a little bit of a political junkie. Like I stay up late for election results. Like, right? Like I, takes a lot of discipline not to stay up crazy late for presidential debates, right? Um, nearest I can tell, the only good thing that will come if it happens to be Biden and Trump is that they're going to have to do the debates earlier before bedtime for both of them, and it, that'll be good for me because we've got to do it at like four in the afternoon before sleepy time, um, and I'll get to watch it, and then I can go to sleep and be productive the next day. Right? Like, I have to be careful. The State of the Union, I'm like, let's make popcorn and enjoy every minute of this. Like, this is kind of what I think about. I'm like a little bit of a political junkie. Yet, maybe despite one little joke a minute or two ago that maybe I shouldn't have made, um, but at some point we have to get to the point where we can laugh as a country. Um, I work really hard not to be partisan. I work really hard not to be political. Why? Because I don't want to do anything that's going to create a stumbling block for people to come to this church and hear 
the gospel of God. But I don't want to just be careful about how I engage in social media and how I preach. I also want to be careful how I talk to my neighbors and my family and my friends. Again, not that I don't have political opinions and political convictions. I just never want to present those in a way that would close a door to the conversation that I really want to have, which is the conversation about who Jesus is and what he's doing in the world, and how he's building his kingdom today, right? So I have to, I have to be careful. I, I, that may or may not apply to, to you, and that's certainly not saying that talking about politics is bad or unhealthy, just saying I need to do it in a way that doesn't destroy relationship, right? You're, you're going to have countless different examples, because ultimately, the reason that Paul is trying to not hinder the gospel is that he's looking for ways to enhance his influence with others. He's not just trying to do no damage. He's actually trying to move the ball forward. This is what he's talking about in verses 19 through 23. Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, which is very interesting because Paul is Jewish, right? You go read Philippians and he would be happy to walk you through his resume. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews in his own words, yet he's saying, hey, when I am around my Jewish brothers and sisters, I'm super careful to observe their cultures and traditions and norms. And Paul probably went to synagogue a lot more than we realize. I became like a Jew to the Jews, to those under the law, like one under the law. If Paul was in a home that kept kosher, Paul was going to keep kosher, right? Though I myself am not under the law. You can see the connection back to chapter 8, to win those under the law. Now, to those who are without the law, to the Gentiles, to those who grew up without ever having read a Hebrew Bible like one without the law, he, he found freedom in Christ, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak. He's talking about those whose consciences would not allow them to do certain things, and Paul's like, look, if your conscience constrains you, I'm happy to follow your lead. I do not need to push that issue. Why? He wants to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may, by every possible means, save some. Paul was trying to live his life in such a way that he was trying to enter into people's world as much as his conscience and the Word of God would allow. He's like, I want to get as far into your world as possible. I want to meet you on your terms as much as possible. In fact, I'm all in. The only place where I would have to take a step back is if entering into your world caused me to somehow violate my conscience. Like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, that is wrong for me to do that. Or if I'm directly contradicting the Word of God. Other than that, he's like, look, I want to respect your customs, preferences, convictions, your culture. I'm in. Why? Now, I do all of this because of the gospel so that I may share in the blessings, right? Paul is trying to enhance his influence with others, right? Go back to Thanksgiving for a minute. It's coming up this Thursday, and it's like, okay, yes, let's be careful with politics. I feel like everybody's learned that one over the last couple of years, right? But we sometimes think about, like, how do I enhance my influence? Like, how do I use Thanksgiving well for the glory of God? Like, how do I have a spiritual impact? I have this desire for my family to know Jesus, and I, I, I want to make it count. And Every once in a while, we will listen to a sermon or read a book or just have this idea that somehow, you know what we need to do? We need to like grab the bull by the horns, take control of the agenda, so somebody's going to offer a thank you, Jesus, for everything kind of blessing, and then it's your obligation before everybody digs in to be like, hey, hang on, time out. Hope it's not too bold, but before we dig in, I would just like to suggest a conversation topic. Here it is. You might want to write this down, Aunt Edna over there, because you're not paying attention, but here it is. If you got hit by a truck tomorrow, would you go to heaven, and how do you know? Discuss. 
pass the potatoes, here we go, right? And, and, and I understand the, the benefit of that question, and there could even be situations and circumstances where that question would be profitable. So if you know the backstory, I'm not picking a fight with D. James Kennedy on that one at all. But I am saying that is only one version and often an unhelpful way to start a gospel conversation because it really short sells the gospel. The gospel is about much more than just what happens when you die. Here's how you be a great evangelist at Thanksgiving or any other day of your life. Here's how you do it at work. Right? It's not like changing around your screensaver so that it says Jesus saves, so that your coworkers walk by and are like, oh, I got it. That's helpful. Thank you, right? It's not being the person that decides you're going to pick the fight at Christmas and you're going to, while everybody else is decorating the cube, this is for the six of you that actually still go to work, but um, for everyone else is dedicate, dedicate, what am I starting to say? Decorating the cube and you decide to put up the like, Jesus is the reason for the season. (laughs) You're like, boom, take that. We'll see what HR has to say. I'm like, "Ah, maybe. Like, that's great. Like, that's fine. You want to be a great evangelist? Here's what you do. Just ask really good questions. You want to be evangelistically effective? Be the most curious person at your Thanksgiving table. And not in some sort of weird, like, discount armchair therapist kind of way where they're, like, sharing something about the job, and you're like, oh, do you think that's because of your relationship with your dad? <laughs> like, we're not, we're, we're, don't do that. Nobody needs that. Like, that, that's, if you want that, you got to go pay for it and get it for real. Like, um... Nobody needs that. But being the person that says, like, oh, man, how are you enjoying your job? Man, what was one of the most encouraging things that happened in your life this year? Man, y'all have had kids. How's that going? Right. You've been married for, like, five years. What, have you, what are you learning? Like, what's the, what's the best book you read this year? Just, like, average decent questions and see where the Spirit of God leads, right? I have found that to be so effective. Like when I take an Uber and I feel like I got to bring up a spiritual conversation, I'm like, I'm a pastor. I got to like get Jesus in the mix here. It gets really weird. When I'm like, hey, how you doing, man? Oh, good. You've been driving for a while? Yeah. Oh, who, what about, it's just amazing. Asking, asking, what made you drive Uber? And people have all kinds of answers to that question. And there's a couple of follow-up questions, and just get people talking, right? Because we want to enhance our influence. Now, the last thought that Paul has is, okay, not only are we trying to like publicly do no harm, and we're trying to enhance our influence a little bit, but we're also going to sense a need to be self-controlled, All right? This is verses 24 through 20. Seven, don't you know that all the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way to win the prize, right? As an aside, he's entering right into the world of ancient Greece. It's obsessed with the Olympics. He's diving right into what they think and talk about. And he's like, y'all know how this works on a marathon. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything, to which they're like, absolutely. They do it to receive a perishable crown. He's not criticizing that at all, but we an imperishable one. So, I do not run. He's now talking about his life as a follower of Jesus, like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. There is just this sense that he is aware that if he gets it wrong, if he goes into the ditch morally or spiritually or ethically, a lot of people get hurt, right? Paul is focused on his personal character, integrity, and his own heart because he's trying to live his life in a 1 Corinthians 11 kind of way where he says to the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. So he spends a lot of time making sure that his internal world is properly ordered. He spends a lot of time asking questions about his own character, about his own integrity, right? He spends a lot of time with living with that kind of intentionality. But what strikes me about this 
is the humility that Paul shows. This is the man that planted the Corinthian church. This is the man that arguably God used more than anybody else in his generation and quite possibly more than anybody else in human history or at least in the last 2,000 years. Yet, he is saying here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and in writing for everybody to read, that he still needs to be really careful because he is aware that he can get himself into trouble really easily. Right, 1 Corinthians 10, he'll say it a little bit more explicitly. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. Every once in a while in the Christian life, we get to the point where we think we've graduated past the point of stupid mistakes. And Paul's like, careful, careful, just watch out. Watch out that you don't disqualify yourself. And whatever that means in terms of limiting your liberty, go for it. What it often means, though, is allowing a couple of brothers or sisters in Christ to have a lot of visibility into your life where they really get to see what you're struggling with and the reality of your story. But do you see what Paul's doing here? Kind of zoom back out. He's a guy with a compelling vision for his life. And because that vision is so hot in his heart, he's constantly running this filter of like, okay, am I hindering the gospel? I don't want to do that. Oh, is this an opportunity to enhance influence? Yeah, I'm in. I want to do that. And man, I'm doing it all in a very self-reflective kind of way, right? As Seth Godin would say, people like us do things like this. We want to be those kind of people who are self-controlled, who enhance our influence, who don't hinder the gospel. But the key is that it all has to flow not just from a vision for our lives, but flow from a deep love for God. These are not three things to do so that God will love you. These are three things that begin to happen in your life when you're deeply convinced that God already does love you because of what Jesus did on the cross. So Father in heaven, we want to come to you right now and we want to bring the reality of our life and we want to ask that you would speak to us through the power of your Spirit. God, these thoughts are not hard to digest in the abstract. But Lord, we need your grace and your wisdom to be able to live them out in the day-to-day reality of our life. It's so easy on Sunday to say amen to the idea of not hindering the gospel and then be astonished and how much we have done that over the course of a past week. Jesus, if there are specific changes that you are leading any of us to make, would you show us? If there are places where you have already given us more influence than we're aware of, Would you open our eyes to the spiritual opportunity that's in front of us? Jesus, if there's places where we have gotten sloppy in our walk with you, would you gently convict our souls? We just ask you to do all this work not based on who we are, but based on who you are. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.